Welcome. This morning, ABC News reported that COVID spiking across the U.S. equates to every minute one new American death. While the world anxiously awaits a vaccine, we are all doing what we can to maintain our sanity and our mental health. And with the holidays rapidly approaching, we are definitely all hoping for some joy. I know I'm not the only one in being incredibly thankful for companies like Spotify, Fubo TV, and Spring Health, who are helping many of us weather these turbulent times. These companies were growing fast way before the pandemic, and the current crisis has certainly accelerated their growth. We need more digital entertainment and wellness companies to scale, especially right now. Well, we really need more companies to be successful full stop. So the pressure and pace to pivot, adapt, and innovate are, are certainly unprecedented, at least in my lifetime. And these companies won't succeed without talented investors, innovators, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, basically all of us. So that's why I'm grateful today to have my friend, Par York and Parson from North Zone. He's gonna help us better understand what it takes for some of these ideas to grow into successful, scalable businesses during early stages of financing in the US, UK, and Europe. Today, I hope you'll learn more about how to take startups through key stages of financing, some of the differences between the US, UK, and Europe, and really how to grow great ideas into successful businesses, whether you're at a big company uh, and you wanna grow something internally, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're an investor trying to help um, other entrepreneurs. I am Angel Gambino. I'm a partner at Prehype and co-created Venture Studio. I'm a serial entrepreneur, media and entertainment executive, and angel investor. So I want to thank you for joining my weekly series where I riff with innovators, entrepreneurs, and investors. Hopefully give some insights and, uh, and inspire you uh, into action. So please join me in the chat in welcoming my friend PJ from North Zone. Hey. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's always so weird when you're like, who's actually out there? Who am I actually talking to? <laughs> but I see some friends in here today of both of ours, so it should be fun. Um, awesome. yeah. So I think you are in Stockholm right now. That's right. I'm in Stockholm, yes. And uh, uh, we, uh, as you probably have read about, we, uh, Sweden is taking a little bit of a different uh, path when it comes to dealing with uh, this pandemic. And uh, uh, we don't know if that is the right uh, path. It's, you know, so far we have kept ourselves re reasonably sane. And uh, it seems like everybody's more or less following the same path uh, in this terrible pandemic. But let's hope that the vaccines will push us back to a more uh, normalcy over the next six or nine months or so. Yes, well, uh, mm. I hope so. It seems like there's a race going on and uh, definitely hopeful. There's a little mm. bit of skepticism, but more hope than anything. Yeah. But this week, uh, I think uh, the 20th was the birthday of Swedish writer Selma Lagerlöf. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 She, um, she was the first uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner in literature, actually, and a, a female, uh, like a giant in our history, basically. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. congrats for her. So I know she mm -hmm. was known primarily for her children's book, The Wonderful Adventures of Nin. Yeah, Nils. Uh, yeah. yeah, Nils. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm thinking Anais Nin, definitely yeah. not the same topic. <laughs> no, so that's right. Mm. And I know she had another series of books. Uh, a neighbor of mine is working with two of his Swedish friends uh, to create kind of an anthology and tribute to uh, to her work. So, so that more people outside of Sweden know who she is and are familiar with her work. But I think people who love children's books definitely know. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and we are going to get into the topic of other female uh, leaders in the areas of uh, entrepreneurship and investing. But um, but before we go there, I think it'd be good. Um, you know, I know, uh, you know, your story, but I think it would be good for others to really hear your story in terms of, 
you know, I, I definitely know that we're going to want to hear about your uh, rock sessions, your heavy metal uh, rock experience. Uh, and I think you're still playing, but maybe no live shows right now. I don't know. But also um, your journey. Your, what's that? Not a whole lot, unfortunately. Yeah. No, are you jamming at home and annoying your neighbors? <laughs> yeah, and actually, you, you can see uh, a couple of my guitars over there in the corner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's perfect for a Spotify investor. Yeah. I think you have to have musical <laughs> instruments everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey, like um, from the beginning of when you really decided? I mean, I know you've done everything under the sun. I feel like we're simpatico that way. But yeah. Um, yeah. when you kind of really started to think, you know, maybe I want to get into venture capital or I want to get into yeah. investing. And what made you decide this is this is what I want to kind of yeah. spend, you know, a decade or more doing? Yeah, I I, I, I did a couple of. Uh, different things. Uh, first, I, I took actually three gap years between high school and, and college, which is uh, a bit unusual. But uh, that that during a period where I got really to think about what I wanted to do with my life. And during that time period, I, among other things, I uh, I played a lot music, and I was considering to go uh, professional. And I was still considering that during uh, uh, university. But eventually, I. Uh, in very much inspired also by my parents who were both uh, professional jazz musicians when they were uh, sort of uh, in their early 20s and my mother uh, she used to tour with uh, Stan Getz and 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 my dad he was uh, he was a drummer with the you know the biggest names in the Swedish uh, jazz scene scene and and basically um, they advised against uh, going down that path so I you know I I, I was a good boy and, and got my degree uh, and then was uh, uh, recruited to a consultancy to McKinsey and I, where I stayed for five years. Um, and um, uh, eventually I kind of wanted to, um, um, to, to test my wings a little bit, bit more and, and, uh, um, and, and I ended up actually being the, the principal owner and CEO of a, like a, a, a uh, uh, a food business, a uh, food distribution business that uh, was struggling. And uh, the way to to sort of fix that problem was, uh, because it's also coincided with the very early years of the, the internet, uh, was that I I found a cheap way of solving the problem by dis, dis, you know deploying really cheap internet technology. And uh, we, we could um, basically change the uh, the, the supply chain as a, as a result of that. And uh, having done that and then recruited a real CEO for the company, I, I, I basically thought that I was an ex expert of internet and uh, technology. So I wanted to go out and, and raise a fund and, and, uh, and do this on a bigger scale with more companies. And, and that uh, in turn led me to, uh, to, to basically build one of the first internet incubators, uh, you know, in parallel to what idea lab was, was in in the U.S. Um, during the sort of the mid late '90s, and uh, that coincided with a dot com uh, hysteria and the, and the ensuing uh, uh, collapse as well. Uh, but I sort of lived through that, and uh, I had actually sold that uh, the the, the in internet incubator just at the peak, and and then I joined Norson, who were former friends from uh, or friends from uh, from my former days at uh, McKinsey. And I've been at Norson since uh, you know early 2000s, and uh, that journey has also been quite interesting because um, um, uh, being a, a tech investor in 2002 was not sort of the easiest job. We were we were something like that your t cat dragged in. You know, nobody really was caring about those. Uh, snake oil salesmen who were selling, you know, ideas that just didn't work in practice. So, so it was a pretty tough time there. Uh, but, but eventually, there were a, a few key um, uh, innovations that happened. Uh, more, more importantly, the the advent of the dynamic and the more secure uh, internet with uh, with Web 2.0 that sort of gave the birth of the first real commercial successes. Uh, and and that's that was sort of the platform that started to build uh, the the internet 
uh, investment ecosystem in uh, uh, in Europe, I would say, and and we started to grow along with them uh, as a as a uh, as an early investor, and and we are probably one or we alongside with Index Ventures are the oldest. Uh, investors in in Europe and then we 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 gradually um, expanded also opening up in um, in London and we opened up in New York um, and we raised bigger funds and obviously we got to work with more and more talented uh, entrepreneurs as the ecosystem grew and and we got a bigger and bigger reach uh, and uh, throughout it this time I think the the common denominator has been that when we partner with really extraordinary entrepreneurs, that's when magic happens and, and almost regardless of what industry you choose to, to address. So that's in a nutshell where, uh, where we came from. Today we are up investing out of our ninth fund. We're predominantly early stage. It's half a billion dollars. And uh, yeah, we have probably some 60, 70 portfolio companies active in the, in the portfolio right now and uh, 16 investment professionals in, in three offices. Yeah, that's a, it's a fascinating journey because I, when I think about that time span, you know, I remember, you know, coming out of one of, you know, my startups, Gameplay.com, which we had listed on AIM, and after the kind of, you know, dot, dot com boom bust, you know, luckily, gameplay is you know still alive and profitable today. But you know, all, very few of those companies survived. And I remember at that time, you know, a headhunter calling me to you know to try to lure me into the BBC to head up all digital services. And I remember thinking, like, oh my God, the commercial market for startups right now is decimated. The BBC is incredible for a lot of different reasons, but it's also probably a very good place to be right now. So. I think it's super cool that you like went and you're just like, I'm going for it. Like, you know, um, so, and you said like across different sectors and in, in terms of uh, North Zone and, and I love some of the choices that, that you guys have made, but how would you, how do you think North Zone is maybe different um, to some other early stage um, VCs and how would you describe the investment thesis other than what we all try to do as investors, invest in the best team? So how would you kind of describe either the investment thesis or when you're kind of looking for different profiles, like what, what you're really looking for? Yeah, I, I, uh, it probably comes as uh, very little surprise, but uh, we also in Norso, we have a, uh, we have embraced the idea that each individual have like a unique set of uh, characteristics uh, that work best for them specifically and then we bring our our team working skills to get together to sort of improve the decision making uh, on on sort of on top of that but so for instance you would not see me do the same deals as my colleague Jeppe in, in London or or, or uh, Mikhail for that matter uh, because we have sort of different ways to relate to the market I for instance I I get really excited about r extremely uh, large markets. Um, and uh, I also would like to see um, like uh, a, a, a substantial differentiation. So for me, uh, being differentiated by having extremely strong execution capabilities is not enough for me. That's like, you know, for me, that's like a, a risk that I can't really uh, live with. But uh, whereas perhaps, my colleague Paul would think that is the only differentiator that works. For me, uh, it's more like this product has to be not just a better mousetrap, it has to be 10 or even 100 times better, which means that it has to be different, which means that some people hate, hate it. And they will take basically tell that story pretty vocally also to people around them that are you nuts investing in this company they their product is just doesn't work or it's it's so different nobody will w like it or anything and that was pretty much you know that that's pretty much how you create real engagement when people really are emotionally invested even against the product that shows that you're sort of you're, you're you're touching people's you know the 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 hearts 
uh, in in both good and bad ways. So the the biggest uh, enemy for me for a, an investment um, uh, situation is where where basically it's not sort of standing out enough when it's sort of nice but not great because then it's sort of uh, it leads you in a direction of thinking that it's good but it's not good enough to really make people care to change their uh, their behaviors which which is most of the time what is required to be successful uh, so so uh, and so uh, that, that's from my perspective and then if there's a common thread with uh, Norzone is that we from the very beginning, were extremely founder centric we were all you know had all of us founded businesses ourselves we had been sitting negotiating with you know sharks who tried to steal the business from us and 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 tried in different ways to uh, uh to view the situation as a zero sum game and we just don't think that is neither appropriate nor particularly helpful for neither the investor nor the, the entrepreneur. So we tried to really, really go to great lengths to uh, align interests between us and the entrepreneur already at the outset. So any decision that we're up uh, to, up against at some point in time, the, the likelihood of us having different read of the situation because we have disalignment of interest is, is virtually zero. We could have different views because we read the, the world in a different way, but we don't read our own uh, sort of desires uh, differently, at least. Yeah, no, I, I get that completely. And I think like um, the, I've dealt with some of those sharks before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you try to tell them like, if it's not a win-win, the company is never going to work. So, mm, yeah. uh, but those those uh, still exist out there. But I'm I'm glad. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, they do quite quite frequently. And and um, to you know, it it sounds stupid for me as a, like an old timer to say that. But uh, inexperienced investors they have a tendency to see it as like a a win lose uh, situation rather than uh, you know pegging up for a long term win win. For sure. Yeah. I know when I've, you know, tried to advise, you know, some founders, um, either ones I've invested in or just, you know, ones that I've met and, you know, they'll refer to the disrespectful term dumb money. But, you know, I've said, you know, a lot of times, you know, and, and I think that they think that they'll be able to just have more freedom with their business and not have to, you know, constantly be micromanaged. And I've said, yeah, but sometimes, you know, being an experience as an investor, you know, you'll run across those ones who, yeah, who see it almost like an adversarial relationship and mm -hmm. that just, yeah, it just doesn't work. But mm -hmm. you were mentioning, um, you know, looking at, you know, business idea, looking at big markets and looking at, you know, business ideas uh, and, and uh, startups and looking at like, is it, is it really something differentiated or something, you know, better than, you know, than what's already kind of in the market. And I think if you're at a big company and you're trying to launch, you know, new products or new services and you're looking at the market, or if you're an entrepreneur, you know, there, it's rare to find something that just doesn't exist at all. And maybe if it doesn't exist at all, it shouldn't exist because there's no real market for it. Who knows? So, so you're entering the market in some way, with products or services that are already out there. So if we used a specific example, um, you know, you were, you know, one of the, you know, first investors in Spotify and, you know, and that time was a really unique time to, I think, to launch the business, you know, I had known, you know, uh, Daniel from, I think it was like Stardall or something mm -hmm. prior, maybe the ad business or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it was, but, so when he was, you know, thinking about, you know, Spotify, he said, oh, you know, can we meet up? Can we talk about it? And he came to London. He was in Stockholm. And, you know, and we we met up uh, in Starbucks and we were talking through it. And that's, you know, when I was at Bebo and I can't remember if we had already sold, but, you know, we were certainly, you know, positioning ourselves and having conversations. And I was telling him about the kind of licensing deals and what he could expect and which terms and you know, from lawyers from Mark Cray to Greg, you know, Gregor Pryor. And, you know, then I was like, okay, but if you're going to go big and you want to go in the U.S., you know, we work with, you know, Fred Davis and, 
you know, so I said, and these are the kind of deals you can get from him. And, you know, we were talking through the whole thing and, you know, but one of my, you know, challenges to him at that stage was, okay, well, you've already got, you know, the, cause he, I said, well, what is it you really want to build? And he said, you know, the, the place where you have all the music in the world, you know, that was kind of how I remember him categorizing it at that stage when he was still kind of thinking about it. And I said, okay, well, you know, there are places where that kind of already exists. Like, and at, you know, we were talking about mm. Napster and mm. then you know, Rhapsody, you know, had its premium service out and obviously YouTube, you know, was out at that stage. And I said, well, YouTube will obviously, you know, get into, you know, music. And, you know, then we started to just talk about like the different players in the ecosystem. So they did exist and, and some of them were actually pretty good. And so when you were looking, so when, you know, when he and the team kind of got together and really started to build Spotify, um, did you, were you thinking, okay, we all know Daniel's just like an amazing entrepreneur, so he's backable no matter what he does? Or, you know, were you thinking, you know, this kind of MVP, the UI is, mm -hmm. is gonna bring people in? Because I remember at the time, you know, I was saying to him, like the way you wanna play it with the labels is we're this small little Swedish company and, you know, just think of us as this little company experimenting over here. Because if they start to see you as a major player who's going for the U.S. market, then it's going to, the licensing deals are going to be a whole like different thing. But, you know, so what were the kind of things when you were looking at the business at the very, very early stages that made you think, okay, yes, this is a big market. You're also a music lover. So you are going to have some propensity there. You also knew Daniel, so you had that relationship. But what did you think, like, they're really going to be able to do something different here and create, you know, the next unicorn? We didn't even have that yeah. phrase at that stage. Yeah, but, you know, what, yeah I, I, I think there were, yeah, I think there were a couple of things apart from Daniel, actually. Uh, uh, it was also, I knew his co-founder, Martin, uh, also pretty well. Yeah. Um, and uh, Martin had already a really big success under his belt, and he he was also the sort of the 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 other you know the yin and the yang the the the, the two the two aspects of these two uh, really strong entrepreneurs uh, came together in an extremely extremely strong way, and what it was more importantly was that. When he started to look, what kind of people they had already at that stage attracted to the the core team? I think they were ten people when I started talking to them about you know seriously about a, an investment, and they were maybe twenty when we actually finally wired the money. Uh, so so uh, they had already at that time uh, uh, landed basically the the foremost expert in the world on you know peer to peer uh, uh, technology transfer but technology and 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 uh, peer to peer uh, uh, traffic so so basically that was that was one of the 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 de uh, sort of determinants of uh, quality the, the second one was that when they ultimately sat me down and it took a while before i got to 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 try uh, try the the demo it was like you know uh, it it was almost like magic because when you press the play button it started play like instantly and then it uh when you know you stopped and you just played and you you changed to different song and and all that stuff that was like like you could see that that was uh, and 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 Martin and Daniel they they went went also to great length to see see now we're doing it through the cell phone and they had like this you know crappy Nokia cell phone that they they actually uh, ran the traffic through and and made it work uh, under very very tough broadband conditions and that impressed me because that was sort of i think the the part of the equation that really didn't work in the uh, in the in the crop that was existing at the time because they were buffering there was like poor quality and and not this sense that it was like wow this is cool so i when i brought the uh, the demo home and and we actually had the same evening we had a party in my house with uh, you know a few friends coming over for dinner and i showed the people and uh, and we used that in my computer as sort of the entertainment central. They were like they were sort of floored everyone, uh, and that I think the the pro product vision 
that came together in just this little demo thing was so incredibly clear. And then the next challenge was obviously, as you, you were alluding to earlier, that, that I had actually invested in, in uh, music startups before and all of them had failed because the, the, the labels were very uncooperative when it comes to, to licensing and, and they were uh, they were really not understanding how, you know, in such a bad shape they were in. So it was a big leap of faith that we uh, had to take at some point in time, whether they were uh, capable of uh, convincing the music industry that they were not going to destroy them further. Like, you know, because at that point in time, you know, that uh, Casal, which was Sandstrom's, uh, you know, was a Swedish company. Uh, the Pirate Bay was a Swedish company, you know, and then Spotify coming. Now, third company that would bring bring the industry to its knees. That that now, that you know, uh, pretty pretty challenging. But once I, you know, I had some contacts into the industry thanks to my pr prior failures, and I understood when I stood uh, spoke to them that they were actually taking Spotify serious. And and that what I think was ultimately what led me to to put you know write this first check and uh, and join the board. Yeah, well, I think that in mm. in that case, in some ways, the timing was great, mm. right? Because you know, I remember what I had said at that time. Look, the labels know they like this is happening. You know, it's inevitable. Uh, mm. Digital streaming, you know, music streaming uh, on a mass scale, mm. and so. They all need somebody to be successful, and it's got to be somebody where they think that they can you know, work with, and and the rest of it. So, if you can, yeah, if if at this time they think you know you're the one to to ultimately become successful, they they need somebody to be successful, and and obviously mm -hmm. there's more than one company to be successful. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how the relationship has you know has evolved over time, and now. You know, some of them think Spotify is the MTV. And when I was at MTV, you know, they would always talk about how we destroyed, you know, the business. And I'm like, I don't know, we might have helped grow it. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, there's some valid arguments too. So when you joined the board, because I think that there are uh, a lot of people who are, you know, either at a stage in their career and have had, you know, they're at a certain level of, you know, seniority in big companies that they could be really, helpful board members or angel investors to some early stage um, startups. Like when, you know, you've, you've got board positions on some amazing companies, you know, Spotify being one of them, Spring Health, I think another Fubo TV, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So right. what would you say, you know, how do people um, prime themselves to become good board members and what makes a good board member? Like what, what do you really need to be doing to, help these companies grow and avoid some of the pitfalls of some of those other companies that weren't so successful. So uh, for me as a adventure investor, as a, I, I think my my contribution is more about sort of the, uh, the growth trajectory and sort of how we how we can be helpful in, in uh, with the entrepreneurs to see how their organization should uh, evolve over time when you go from you know being 10 15 people to uh, ultimately 6700 that spotify is today it's like that's a pretty big transformation that both the management team has to do and the ceo and, and everyone around so so that's that's sort of that's i think that's what i do um, but what I don't have in, in most companies is that I don't have domain expertise. So I think that is the, uh, uh, the very important uh, role that uh, many uh, seasoned executives could bring to the table. And, and there are far too few of uh, people with domain expertise in startups uh, where they can um, come and basically understand, you know, show the company yeah, the 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 big you know uh, power structures and and also how to uh, relate to the the key decision makers and also absolutely lend a, a bit of credibility to it. And then in Fubo, where I joined the board uh, maybe five six years ago or so, uh, we had a few of the uh, executives from the the media industry joining at the same time, and they you know, they have very little experience in you know 
hyperscaling a company like FUBA has done, but they had tremendously important uh, you know, credibility in the content market. And that was something that, that was absolutely key for the company to succeed. So uh, I think uh, leveraging the, uh, the, the domain expertise is, is really in demand and also something that, that should be done. But then at the same time, uh, a startup actually operates with the different different minds than a big company in, in many ways. And, and the most important one is that you're always in, in survival. You're trying to grow as fast as possible. And the cost of not growing as fast as possible is that you die. So that basically you're sort of co constantly um, uh, on this Occam's razor of, you know, being, you know, either, you know, uh, flourishing or dying, and and that that is that is a, a, a an uneasy position for someone to to be in, and and I've seen some board members coming from traditional industries that just uh, they they uh, they get a little intimidated by that kind of risk exposure and and don't really thrive as a consequence. So I think having that um, uh, you know clear is is important before you you would consider taking a board seat. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, uh, at Prehype and co-created, you know, Venture Studio, we partner with big corporates, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times their chief innovation officer or their innovation teams or, or different areas of the business. And, you know, we'll work with them, we'll scan the market to see if there's investment opportunities or partnership opportunities. Um, and, and yeah, investment acquisition partnership opportunities. And if they're not there, then we work with them to create these entirely new, you know, startups. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you have to have it at enough distance and arm's length from the big corporate that it doesn't get tied down in some of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. and policy and, and all mm -hmm. of the, all of those different things that would slow a startup down. But, and as you know, from your kind of incubator days, you, and, and building on your point about deep domain expertise, the the unfair advantage for those startups is that they've got access to all those resources but the deep domain expertise so they can learn much much quicker than if they were coming into it you know with kind of complete Indeed. tabla rasa right so mm -hmm. yeah i think a combination of those things are are great in in boards and and across the teams like once once you have enough you know money and traction to be able to buy in some of that expertise and the mm -hmm. operating team as well. So if, if in terms of like the, the board, um, what makes a good kind of, you know, board uh, member, what are your thoughts? You mentioned like Martin and, you know, Daniel and, and obviously these other founders that you've looked at as, you know, as being almost magical. And so mm -hmm. how would you describe what makes a good founder and and how is that different from what makes a good maybe intrapreneur at a big company like what are what do you look for when you're meeting founders for the first IT you know, like maybe you like the idea you like the market then when you're specifically looking at the founding team or the founder what is it that you're kind of looking for and is that similar to somebody who's working in a big global corporation uh, and obviously there are a lot of differences as well but mm -hmm. Those people who are in there who think like, I want to launch this new business within this company and mm -hmm. I love what startups are doing, but you know, I'm more of a big company person. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the attributes or behaviors or skills in, in both of those kind of profiles? Yeah, so uh, it's, um, uh, I would say on the on the founder side, uh, let, let's start with what, what sort of uh, is similar, you know, common traits in that regard. I would say that, um, having uh, this uh, enormously, you know, uh, tenacity and and grit and and the ability to sort of say the same thing over and over again and be as committed every time, because it's sort of it's it's about uh, understanding that most people will actually, as an instinct, say no, and and you shouldn't really and and if you believe in 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 yourself and the and the, the the stuff that you're you're up to do, uh, you don't take that no for an answer, and and you you sort of and you're prepared to say the same argument why it's a good idea to another like thousand people, 
and and you th and and it matters to you. It's not just like you know you don't feel like a broken record. It's like you actually it's important for you to tell that story that ten thousand times. Uh, that that it's actually important to do it this way. If 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 that tenacity is there, I think that has to be regardless if you're in a big corporate or or a, or a startup. I think perhaps in a if you're in a startup situation, um, uh, you uh, you you actually you you really need to be able to uh, uh, to also um, go from sort of doing everything. Um, and have no support whatsoever to all of a sudden, you know, change your own job description to actually work through others and, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, change that yet again. And, and, and you have to uh, look at yourself as, a, as like a, a, a tool for, you know, realizing the idea and the and the and the problem that you're trying to solve, uh, and and uh, and I think the the most successful entrepreneurs um, I, that I've met, at least, they are they are they're pre predominantly motivated by you know what progress the company is doing. They're uh, and and the sort of sometimes when you see that there is a big ego involved, uh, that ego is actually it's more like a proxy ego. It's a pro. It's an ego that is about the business, uh, that is incredibly strong, um, and uh, and then also uh, their 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 motivation is very seldom about money. Uh, it's about sort of making sure that the the idea actually happens and that it gets the chance that they think it deserves, um, and uh, uh, and I think. Um, uh, an entrepreneur can can probably sort of go a little too long, and uh, and um, and try a little too you know too many times and and not realize that you know it's time to move on. Whereas I think when you're in a big corporation, they will you know nudge you and say that you know let's let's try the this other project instead, and um, uh, and and you know use your 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 talents elsewhere. Uh, so, so uh, it, it's. I wouldn't say that it's that much of a difference between the two uh, categories. It's that the the the, the demands on on personal change is probably greater for a uh, for a founder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that yeah. The adaptability in terms of yeah the very core of your role kind of changing over time. I think is is mm -hmm. a really important factor. I agree. And in terms of the talent that you look for, I think, um, you know, as as a woman, I'm always and and even I like to say beyond that, but I can only speak to that. Um, you know, I like to see when investors are making uh, a proactive approach to uh, seeking out. Uh, female founders um, and other, as Arlen puts it, you know, uh, underestimated um, founders, you know, so BIPOC, et cetera. And, uh, and, you know, and I think part of where that comes from is just a natural who's in our network, you know, and who do we get introduced to? And, and then those are the kind of opportunities that you see. But in terms of, you know, things that we can be doing both to open up more opportunities for uh, for women and for other kind of, you know, underestimated um, uh, professionals to become VCs or to become investors. I think that's one, you know, the more we do for that, maybe the, the wider or more diverse the investment opportunities. I don't know. I think that's a poss possible outcome. Um, but what are some of the things either that you or that Northstone does? Because I know you guys, you know, you guys have um, uh, a lot of diversity in terms of I know you've got a couple of uh, female partners and you've got a lot of uh, associates and some of the Silicon Valley, you know, VCs over here are just getting their first female um, partners. And so I'm wondering what you guys do or what you do or what you think we should all do. Mm -hmm. um, really widen that net a bit and to be at least more inclusive in terms of creating opportunities for 
those, you know, those founders to, to at mm -hmm. least pitch and for those people to kind of join funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, starting with us, when we were back in 2012, we were uh, at the time seven general partners. We were all uh, white middle-aged dudes uh, with the same, you know, socioeconomic background from the, you know, Northern Europe. And, uh, uh, and we sort of uh, looked at each other and said that, you know, this is, this is getting pathetic. You know, we're, we're, we have absolutely no uh, diversity uh, ourselves and uh, it's not going to cut it if, if, uh, for the long haul. So we started to uh, uh, question our, you know, how we looked ourselves. And at the same time, we knew that we had a, uh, a generation shift that was pending. And so we started that journey then and, and decided to, to change. And, and today, eight years later, we actually do have 50% uh, female investors. Uh, we have uh, uh, to date uh, just uh, had the, the chance to, to, to promote two uh, female partners, two general partners and one, uh, one uh, principal so far. Uh, and we've also started to uh, look at di diversity. Uh, thank you. Um, diversity uh, more broadly, um, and if considering that we are uh, we have the the bulk of our people in in Europe, the sort of diversity in Europe is is more about uh, gender diversity than than racial diversity and ethnical uh, diversity so uh, but we have nevertheless uh, started to to work along those um, uh, dimensions as well because we you know if you look at um, pretty much all the research that has been done and, and McKinsey did a pretty uh, thorough analysis of that two years ago where they saw that that the uh, the returns of diverse teams were uh, were actually much stronger uh, simply put, uh, so so um, uh, and actually, uh, you know, I don't know if that is the sole reason, but we have uh, we have much broader uh, deal flow access now than we've ever had had before, and we have also uh, increased our share of uh, uh, like uh, mixed uh, founder teams, uh, you know, dramatically. Uh, but we're far from where we should be uh, still. And I, and I think the fact that we have now 50% female investors on board at least makes us uh, uh, exposed to uh, like the, the, the entire market of uh, potential entrepreneurs that, uh, that are, would be seeking capital. Uh, but we have absolutely blind spots, and, and I think this is a this is an issue that has been relatively, um, you know, recently brought up to the top of the agenda of many venture firms. So, so I I I see see change happening in real time. It's uh, relatively slow, but it's happening. And uh, uh, what I think is that when you see more and more um, role models uh, coming out into the market. We, you know, strong female founders, uh, strong uh, uh, people of color founders that uh, that really make a, a dent in the market. That sort of uh, helps uh, on both sides of the of the equation, both on the entrepreneurial side and and the uh, finance side. So I, I think the uh, the long term. Um, the, the long-term desire, I think, is clear from ev every uh, part. You know, there just doesn't make sense to to not be diverse. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think that data that's come out of McKinsey, and then now there's like Kaufman has done some research, and mm -hmm. and everything's you know you know coming out in the same way that the you know more like female founders outperform male founders that. Mm -hmm. More diverse teams perform less diverse teams. So I, I, I hope you're right. And I do think that the more prominent, successful uh, entrepreneurs and investors can can really help pave the way for you know for more of those success stories to, mm -hmm. to kind of come about. That's mm -hmm. that's my hope. We, we we can do our best to support um, support them. And and you mentioned. Um, uh, you know, the uh, you've ha had new appointments in terms of principals and uh, and GPs, you know, for um, 
for entrepreneurs who are pitching either their seed or their A rounds, can you share a little bit about the differences between, uh, you know, the role of the angel investor, you know, like myself versus, you know, uh, becoming an LP or even launching a new fund? I just did this, you know, the this round of conversations uh, with uh, Stanford and 500 startups, and it was all kind of new fund managers. And it was interesting because I would say the Probably 70% of these new fund managers, by the way, were all uh, using as their kind of, as part of their investment thesis, um, heavily focused on, you know, uh, female founders and and people of color and, and other diverse founders. So I was I was really kind of reassured by that. But what do you think? How would you describe the differences between the different roles between a GP and LP? Uh, angel investor, and then, and even strategic investors, and what roles they can play in helping a startup get from pre-seed to seed and seed to A, and if there's any differences in 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 your eyes between like UK, Europe, and the US. Yeah, so uh, starting with uh, sort of the difference between the the demands of a seed uh, investment and and or a Series A, I think first uh, uh, over the past. Uh, Maybe three or four years, the the seed investment size has has grown quite a lot, and and also Series A. So you could actually argue that there's been almost like a uh, a, sh a shift in uh, in 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 the way you you sort of label uh, these uh, uh, the, these items. And and I would say that uh, a seed investment today um, typically involves a product that has already hit the market uh, or is pretty close to product market fit. And, and I think pr product market fit is a, is a buzzword that is pretty helpful because it's, it tells a lot. Um, and, and you can, uh, you can dress that comp that, that uh, concept in, in pretty, in, in many different guises. But I think the, the important thing is that when there is like a, when you don't have to either give the product away or, or that you have to sell the crap out of it and you know, overspend on customer acquisition, uh, then, then there is a pretty good indication that you're close to product uh, market fit. And, and for us, that is sort of the, the golden dif you know, differential between seed and Series A. I think we would expect a Series A company to have uh, you know, clear indications of, uh, of a product market fit and not uh, on on a seed company and and on a seed company i would expect to have sort of the the core lineup already clear that the the three four people who'd really do the trick in in sort of defining the product and and taking it to product market fit uh, and also have the the star quality and the the uh, magnetism required to to attract the other really skilled people uh, so uh, th those are the I would say that the the, two, the 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 most important factors for determining between the seed and the, and the Series A investor. That means that you know, for for me as a as a Series A investor, I have to be um, uh, both look at the team and the market and the product. Whereas a seed investor predominantly has to look at the team and the team quality and the and the market. You know, the the strategic approach. Uh, because there are no other proof points to actually uh, uh, relate to. Uh, if you if then then change the perspective and talk about an LP, a, a, a fund investor, I think the the role of a fund investor is um, yeah, first and foremost to you know, decide uh, which um, GPs to back uh, because there are you know there are lots of GPs out there in all kinds of um uh, categories being from you know super early stage to you know really late stage and um and i think uh being an lp uh is also uh you shouldn't do it unless you're prepared to lock up your money for a long time and also def uh, a high, highly diversified portfolio because it is, you know, although it ha I hate to uh, say it myself, it's it's largely a hits business. So um, 
uh, if we are successful in finding maybe three or four really uh, good companies in our portfolio, which typically will consist of 20, 25 companies, uh, the, the timing when we uh, at ultimately uh, get a liquidation event out of those, it's it's very unpredictable. And it, it can go like in the case of Spotify, it took us 12 years from the first investment to we actually sold the, uh, our, our stake. We're at a, a you know, phenomenal uh, return, of course, it was like 100x or something like that. So, so it, it, was, it, it was fantastic. But if you're not prepared to, to sort of lock up your money for quite some time, then it will be more frustrating than, than anything else. And for strategics, I think, Strategists could actually take uh, a, like a dual approach here. Both invest in as LPs in uh, in a you know a number of venture funds to get exposure to the kind of strategic challenges that your uh, your business may uh, be facing over the next decade or so, and, and get access to. Uh, the, the movers and the shakers indirectly in that way. Uh, and you can also invest directly as a strategic uh, investor into those companies that are you know, closest to your, uh, your strategic uh, direction. And uh, there are a couple of sort of pitfalls in that. And most, uh, most uh, companies would probably say that, you know, yeah, we would love to have you invest in our company as long as you don't get any, you know, any say or that you actually we we won't even get give you any information about the company so there there are like uh, there there are some uh, some pitfalls in making that work for both parties um so so i would i would uh, definitely recommend to engage by investing in several venture funds and both seed and early and later stage funds uh it's a good way to sort of see what's going on and make sure that that's a part of the the business development um, office not necessarily just a part of the sort of uh, uh, financial management in the business where where sort of the CFO sits on the on the on the remit mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when I talk to, you know, founders, a lot of times I say like strategics can be great for a lot of reasons. Um, but even, you know, uh, one of the risks is, you know, make sure you're not getting too, you know, closely entwined with somebody that might prevent some kind of other exit opportunity or some other kind of partnership opportunity because, you know, their competitor doesn't want to work with you because, you know, they're an investor. So you have to be careful about, you know, how you choose them. And I agree. I think that on the strategic side and as an angel investor, there are a lot of reasons to invest beyond just getting a hundred plus X return, which mm -hmm always, you know, top of the agenda in terms of you know, desires of any investment, you know, but, uh, but expanding your network, expanding your knowledge base, you know, learning, you know, getting access to IP that you wouldn't otherwise get for another couple of years when it's more widely available mm -hmm. in the market. I think there are a lot of great reasons for strategics um, to invest at the kind of LP level. And I agree in terms of multiple funds and also, you know, for angels to kind of you know, bring whatever their domain expertise is or whatever their skill is. Like if their skill is being able to find great talent or being able to help get customers, you know, more quickly or help get, you know, financing, then they can bring a lot more to an investment than just the capital. So I want to say we've had some questions come in. And so um, people can feel free to add some questions uh, into the chat and we can um, take those here in a few minutes. And, you know, and one of the things that I had been thinking about in anticipation of talking to you today, so I think I haven't seen you since we last met up in New York, which feels like ages yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. um, if you were going to, let's just say hypothetically, start a, a new company yourself as an operator, as a founder today, or mm. if you were going to start a new fund outside of Northstone, what are you, you like to focus on the big markets, as you said. So 
what, you know, what would be the areas that you would focus on or those entrepreneurs who maybe they've had a success and they're not ready to retire. They've like, they've had some, you know, some good experience, but they haven't quite found their next idea or an entrepreneur who's like, you know, I want to do something other than just my, you know, normal day job. What are the areas that you would focus on if you were just kind of starting now? Yeah. So, so it's, uh, 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 there are, uh, there are lots of areas that you could uh, get into, and and you know, just to, to set a little bit sort of the the difference in how the markets work to, today compared to ten years ago is was that that when I compare a startup today against like an incumbent, being it in in healthcare, in education, in uh, uh, in uh, fintech, for instance, or in uh, um in uh, like the enterprise software it's almost um always the case that they have access to more talent than the incumbent lower operating costs because they're choosing sort of more modern operating infrastructure and uh, and they can scale much faster they actually have lower customer acquisition costs than what the incumbents have and more surprisingly, thanks to the very you know uh, lively capital markets, they have even have lower capital costs than the most uh, uh, large companies have. Because when they need to start a new project, they need to meet certain internal rate of return requirements that are uh, require you know almost like instant success. And that is not a part of the startup model. So I would go after you know pretty much any of these big you know. Uh, like almost uh, uh, everyday markets, everything from healthcare to fintech to uh, you know groceries even, um, and uh, ed tech and such, uh, because there are you know there are like uh, low hanging fruit all over the place there. So uh, um, and very seldom um, we see the incumbents as the the the, the the difficult competitors. It's other startups that are competing for sort of the the big funding uh, success, which is a requirement to, to actually scale really fast. So, um, so I I would uh, I would probably maybe I would go back to um, uh, to uh, to the food industry actually in that regard because I you know that was a fun time uh, but you know I, I would do it so much better this time. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you uh, have a lot of problems to solve right now. Yeah. Yeah. Industry, so, <laughs> so um, one of the questions here. So, can we get some reference points on typical seed round size these days? And again, there are some differences depending on which market you're in. What is a kind of normal seed round size? And uh, and we have a question about su most surprising investment experience or one that taught you the most. Um, I, I've I've got plenty, but let's have you. Yeah. Another yeah. question is around um, how would you define kind of founder friendly terms, and how mm -hmm. would people go about? making sure that the terms are kind of as founder friendly as possible. So there's yeah. a there. So, so on, uh, I'll start with that. Uh, the, the last question on founder friendly terms. And I think uh, uh, there, there are, uh, th this is like a sliding scale also, but for instance, we don't never have problems with common shares because we think that they are symmetrical. But uh, if, if the founder has already, uh, raised uh, preference shares, then it will be. It's hard for us to to accept common shares because then we, it will be asymmetrical compared to the other investors. So, so that's also something that sort of that's one example. The other one is that we uh, we want to make sure that uh, that the um, uh, that that sort of that 
there isn't too much investor power in the boardroom and too much investor power on the protected provisions like uh, vetoes and stuff like that. So we, we typically look at those terms when we invest and with where there are prior investors on board. And, and quite often there is there's a lot of ego involved in those negotiations because if we say that, you know, we don't want the prior investor to have an veto anymore, they take it personally like we don't like that person no but which is not the case we really just want to make sure that we we have uh aligned interests so so that there is like a good discussion so that the board actually decides the uh, you know on, on co you know areas of conflict rather than some sort of agreement you, that you had uh, that you wrote two three years ago so so um those are you know examples of uh, founder friendly terms and and uh uh, also, we we have very seldom used anti-dilution um, uh, terms in our uh, uh, successfully. Uh, we we had that always in our term sheet, you know, way back. Uh, now we sometimes have it when all the prior rounds have those because then we sort of we don't want to get put in a disadvantage. But we th we actually don't think they are particularly good for neither for the pricing of the the security itself nor for the sort of the the, the alignment of interest yeah. and, and the second uh, question was um uh on yeah, yeah. round five yeah. And seed round size. Yes, seed round sizes. I would say that a typical seed round today is uh you know two to five million uh and uh, a series a today is like 10 ish Yeah, and do you think that there are many differences in different markets? I think they're they're starting to kind of be more congruent in terms of mm -hmm. uh, Europe and the U.S. Yeah. And, and and even that town. Yeah. I and I've seen actually thirty million dollar Series A's as well, and even fifty million. So it's there are obviously outliers uh, all over the place. But if, you know, if there is, uh, 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 those are probably the the easiest way to and and uh, also comparing uh, the U.S. with um, uh, with Europe, uh, the U.S. has a tendency to to still have bigger rounds, although that the the difference is not as great as it used to be, and uh, also uh, since the pandemic, I would say that also you would find European funds being active in the U.S. and and vice versa, uh, lots of U.S. funds being active in Europe as well, so. So you 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 can actually get access to both categories of investors in on both continents. Yeah, it's been interesting to see some of the you know bigger Silicon Valley players that weren't yeah. already in Europe starting to make uh, moves over there, giving you yeah. guys a bit of competition in your own <laughs> backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and one of the questions was any kind of surprise surprising uh scenarios that came out of any of your uh investments things that you weren't expecting uh well i would say uh most investments have <laughs> that there are you know some level of surprise i would say that this past um six months have actually uh, i would say to a large degree been a, a surprise across the board because i wouldn't have dreamed when i was uh, asked to participate in a number of um, uh, panels in like March and April about the sort of impending crash of uh, the market due to pandemic to this pandemic. That I actually now today look back on the best six months that we've ever had as a as a fund because the the whole idea of of a digital transformation has been fast forwarded by many many years during this time period and and never ha would have had experienced that our portfolio company you know our portfolio typically we have like you know 50 60 percent of them are you know pretty close to meeting their targets one odd of them are typically you know above the target then we we celebrate and say yeah hell yeah they're doing really well and then the others are far from meeting their targets that's sort of the the, the way that uh, an a venture investor you know is used to performance because you know we are 
eternal optimists. Uh, but now during these past six months, it's been just crazy. Everyone has been outperforming their plans and, and by a huge amount. We we had we invested in Hopin, which is the uh, an, an online uh, conference platform that we invested in January, and and they uh, they had forty customers at the time, and and we we were in their seed round, and they just closed a two billion dollar valuation round uh, you know, nine months later uh, with you know hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, paying customers. So and that's like you know it that's that's obviously luck lucky shot in in many many uh, regards but uh, it's um, I think this this uh, past time has been you know very very surprising yeah and you know like when we started talking about how um, you know the pandemic has really accelerated a lot of growth or trends that were already occurring and I think with early stage investors, you know, you're, you're a broker of surprises. You're like, you know, everything's a surprise because it's so early. You can only make a certain amount of assumptions and, and predictions. Um, but part of what you are doing is you're kind of looking into the future and, and making predictions about what, you know, what's going to happen. And, and while I don't think we could have predicted maybe the scale or the duration, uh, you know, or maybe even entirely the pandemic, uh, if if you place the bets well, then those businesses are going to be doing incredibly well, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think it's great that your portfolio is benefiting from that. And and I think one of the things that you know that I was hoping for and am hoping for through this series is that you know that people will feel um, uh, will get some insights out of these kinds of conversations that they might even be inspired to action to either become an investor or become an advisor or board member or to start their own companies or create a new product or service, you know, inside of, of a company and to feel a little more confident and, you know, in doing that. And I think, you know, uh, what I'll do is I'll, you know, for some of these questions, uh, I'll, I'll create some summary points in terms of the advice that you provide and I'll check those with you and then I'll, I'll share them for those who either didn't catch this or, um, or didn't, you know, take notes and, and just listen and relied on their memory. But one, one question I've got for you before we go is, uh, is my last question is around like, so, uh, this came from, uh, a Shabbat dinner in LA with a bunch of music execs and musicians and stuff. And I just fell in love with it. So, so now I end a lot of my dinners at my house in this way. So um, your thorn, your uh, rose, and your bud. So like your thorn, like what's like challenging to you right now or frustrating for you right now? Your uh, bud is around like what you're hopeful about or looking forward to, and your rose is like, I'm super excited about this. It might be the portfolio is rocking. I'm very happy about this. <laughs> so what, what are yours? Yeah, I uh, I think uh, uh, starting with a thorn, um, I do. Uh, uh, I, you know, I'm 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 really concerned about that there are too many imbalances in in the world today uh, that need to somehow be corrected, or they will correct themselves in a very painful way for us. So, um, and, uh, you know, uh, m maybe we shouldn't sort of go into politics here, but I think I was really relieved by uh, the, the news today that there is a transition happening uh, to the new presidency and, uh, uh, and that, uh, but that's sort of, that's just one part of the, you know, of, of a long path to, to work on everything from, uh, you know, the inequality issues that are not just happening in the U.S. It's happening uh, elsewhere. Uh, I think also that the, the climate um, uh, challenge is has you know for quite some time not been taken seriously by the largest uh, economy in the world, and and that uh, now we need to really start moving there. Uh, so that's that's my thorn. I, I I hope that that will turn into a bud at some point. Um, uh, 
when it comes to uh, um, uh, the, the, you know, as I said, you know, the the the, the big shiny flower right now is that uh, our portfolio is really, really doing incredibly well, and I think also in uh, in in the sense of of the bud, I think also. Uh, it sort of represents two things for me. One is that I do have, uh, I think I've sort of also for myself found a, a new role in in how I interact with um, with uh, my uh, uh, with, with the, the entrepreneurs that I work with, uh, and and that's a that's a an idea that I want want to explore further as I you know progress into this. This profession that I've already been in for you know, 25 years, but you know it's uh, uh, and it's becoming more and more like you know, uh, uh, in, and I've been referred to as like the an entrepreneur shrink, uh, and and that is uh, that is I think is a uh, uh, pretty interesting uh, path to to pursue to to go more in that direction rather than think about st strategies and stuff like, but rather think how how can an uh, an entrepreneur really find the best of herself or himself. Yeah, I, I I love that because I think, you know, as a board member of early stage startups, I feel like my time is split sometimes between, you know, strategy and execution and, and helping in those ways, you know, and in terms of making, you know, big decisions. But the other part of it is just kind of being a cheerleader, <laughs> you know, and, and helping because, as a founder, you can feel very alone and it's so intense and stressful and, you know, add that on to everything that's happening in the world right now. And, you know, the rest of it, I think, uh, yeah, if, if you're opening that up, I think you'll get a lot of takers. <laughs> cool. Well, I just want to thank you again, uh, for joining us. And uh, and I'll kind of write the summary and pass it your way and see if we can add any more value to, to those who have watched. And yeah, and I can't wait to get you back over here. So uh, no, yes. no. it's going to improve soon. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Angel. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Right. Yeah.